Hello everyone! This is Open Book with Betty's Booklist, the show where your favorite authors are an open book and tell me all about their exciting new releases. Today I'm joined by Casey McQuiston. Casey is a New York Times best-selling author and I Kiss Cheryl Wheeler is their third novel. This queer romance centers around Chloe as she tracks down Cheryl Wheeler with the help of two new friends. It's funny and charming and I absolutely loved it. Casey, it's so nice to meet you. I'm so glad we could hop on. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to talk. Yeah, well, I love all of your books, but I especially loved I Kiss Cheryl Wheeler. Could you start by telling us a little bit about it? Oh, yeah. Yeah, here it is. This is my very first finished copy. Um, I Kiss Cheryl Wheeler is uh, my very first YA novel, um, and it is a rom-com ensemble rom-com um about uh, uh three classmates who's uh all share the same crush on this girl shara wheeler who's the prom queen um and before graduation she runs away on prom night and the three of them are left putting together the pieces and trying to follow her clues to figure out where she went and why she left it was such a fun read it reminded me of other books like do you, did you read Paper Towns? That came out right when I was in high school and it reminded me a little bit of that, like the classic John Green, like really? YA high school vibes. And it was just so lovely. Yeah, it was funny. Um, I had actually never read Paper Towns when I first came up with the idea for this book. I honestly didn't even really know what Paper Towns was about until um, I had had the idea and I was talking to a friend of mine about it. And she was like, oh, well, you know, like your comp is gonna be Paper Towns. And I was like, oh, really? So I went and read it and um, there was so much about it that I really, really wanted to play with um, as, you know, sort of a staple of the YA genre of the past, I guess, 10 years, more than 10 years now. Um, I know, uh, but, you know, the, the classic girl who everyone loves, like cool girl, popular girl, whatever. Um, and I feel like that book was kind of subverting that trope from the point of view of like what if we're all just projecting something onto this girl and she never really wanted to be special um and I loved the idea of taking that and like su double subverting it and being like well what if that girl did want to be special um and what would motivate her to want to do something like this and run away and leave a trail of clues intentionally um what kind of person would that be like and, and um is there a room for teenage girls like that in YA, you know? Um, I love that this book is so much about like difficult, terrible girls, teenage girls specifically, because um, I love writing them. I love reading them. I feel like girls get so much pressure and so much, you know, so many expectations applied to them. Um, and it's really, really fun to get to let them be terrible um, and let that be a fun story. Uh, so. That was kind of definitely I think I was inspired by, um, you know, the state of, you know, some of the classic ideas of teenage girls in YA. Um, and I was also just inspired by, you know, books like um, Seven Husbands of Evelyn Hugo and That's my Where'd You Go Bernadette. Yeah, yeah. Um, and like Where'd You Go Bernadette, which are both about like kind of unpacking this like mysterious larger than like titular character. I guess Shara Wheeler was really heavily inspired by Where'd You Go, Bernadette, Seven Husbands of Evelyn Hugo, um, stories, even I would say Gone Girl, like stories about this like really enigmatic um, female, like anti-hero kind of character um, and unpacking everything um, that came together to make her who she is. Um, and to do that as a rom-com and a teen rom-com and like a fun, campy, messy, weird teen rom-com was like so much fun. It's so many things I love in fiction all in one place. So I had a great time. Yeah, I mean, I absolutely loved it. And Gone Girl is one of my favorites too. So I totally see how it brings all of that together. Where did you get the first <laughs> root of the idea? Was it just wanting to play on these YA themes or like how did it come to you that you would leave these clues and have it be like almost like a chase? Um, well, like I said, I think that um, Where'd You Go Bernadette was a big inspiration. Also, I have watched every season of Pretty Little Liars multiple times. Um, and, and I 
I feel like I feel so nostalgic for that like early mid 2000s um like gossip girl type of storytelling where there's this one big mysterious character at the center who's kind of a framing device and creates space for all of these other things to happen um and so like I was kind of drawing on inspiration from those things um and I I was like how can I combine all of these things like roll them all together all of my favorite things into something that is one story and so that was where I had this idea of we've got small town princess um everyone loves her she's but nobody really knows her um and and her kind of creating her own mystery around herself um so I feel like those were some of the biggest inspirations was literally just pulling on all of my favorite things um and things that I've watched and read the most times and being like what if I just put it all in and had fun mm -hmm. that's awesome that sounds like an ideal project to be working on how do you yeah, feel different yeah, yeah. to be writing YA versus adult fiction you know it's interesting um in terms of like my writing style, I actually don't feel like I changed that much. I mean, obviously this book is much more of like a PG-13 rating rather than an R rating, but um, there are so many young readers that love my books already. Um, I know personally, I've talked to a lot of teenage readers who've read my first two books and I knew that they would <clears throat> not appreciate it if all of a sudden I started talking to them differently when I was writing YA. I didn't want them to feel talked down to um, or like I was handling them with kid gloves. And so I really didn't change a lot of like my sense of humor. Um, I think I held back a little bit when it came to prose, just um, wanting it to be a little more straightforward for some of those younger YA readers. Um, but, you know, I think the biggest difference really was themes um, and what the characters act like. Um, you, when you have, you know, 17, 18 year, 18 year old characters, they are not going to be right all the time. They're not going to make all the best choices. They're not going to always react proportionately to things. Um, and I needed to give them room to be messy and to do all of that stuff. And um, and I guess honestly, they get they can get away with more than characters in an adult book because um, they're teens and they're can. I don't know when I was a teen, I was a hot mess, and so I was trying to be true to that. Um, but ultimately, though, I think that a lot of people who read my first two books will read this book and and still feel like, oh, this is like a Casey Bequist book, and this feels the way I expected, you know, something that Casey wrote to feel. Um, so big changes but also very very small changes that totally makes sense i mean it definitely still felt like you when i read it i was like anxiously awaiting my copy of it so i was really excited and i think everyone who read your last two books will love it i mean i really love one last stop especially so yeah, yeah thank, thank you, you. How, what's your writing process like was this book any different now that you have two other books under your belt this one was hard because it was my quarantine book. You know, um, I, it was, it was really, I started writing the first draft like right around the beginning of quarantine. Um, and at the beginning it was like, oh, this is like gonna be a great opportunity for me to like basically do like an at-home writing retreat and like really focus on this book. And then within the first two months, it was like, I can't focus on anything because the world is terrifying. and oh my God, how am I going to write a romantic comedy? <laughs> like, I, how, how am I going to do this? Um, and God, that first draft was so hard to write um, just with everything that was going on. And so I really had to get a lot more like regimented with my writing than I have been before. My first two books, I kind of just like wrote whenever I felt like it. There would be days that I, there would be weeks that like I would skip a few days and then like 5,000 words would just come pouring out of me. Um, and with this one, it was a lot more like, okay, I'm getting up. It's 9 a.m. I'm going to write. I have until five to get this many words done. And that is just what has to happen today. And if they are terrible words, we'll throw them out tomorrow. But um, so it was, it was really, really a huge challenge and a huge shakeup of my typical um drafting style uh but thankfully i have a lot of friends who are writers and we would do like writing sprints and 
we'd have like a discord server for writing uh, where we keep up with each other. Um, and yeah, I mean, I think this time more than any other time, my outline changed a lot from start to finish. I usually work really strictly off my outline. And this time around, like I had to rework the plot more than once because my brain was just not, not, um, not getting it. Um, so I would say it was a huge challenge, but it was also super fun and super rewarding because I feel like with every edit and every draft and every, every time, every like day that I had to force myself to really work on it, um, it got a little bit better, a little bit better. And I can feel like all of those layers and all of like the seasoning of it um, that is like makes it what it is. And I think that's really cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's almost like it all accumulated over time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what's your like career origin story? How did you first start writing back before you even had written your first book? Like what got you into this? Um, I mean, it's hard to even answer that because I can't remember a time that I didn't write or like want to be a writer or consider myself a writer. Um, I mean, like I literally remember being like in preschool, kindergarten, like making up stories on the playground and like writing little picture books in class. Um, and so it was just like always what I felt like I wanted to do. And I, I knew on some level that I was pretty good at it. Um, and that if I kept trying, I could get really good at it. Um, and so I did a lot of, um, I just did, I, I can't even, there's so many like story ideas and probably on my parents, like windows 95 in an attic somewhere, there's like a bunch of middle grade books that I wrote when I was like 10. Um, and then when I got into high school, I got really into like YA fantasy. Um, and I was like really into twilight and really into like, you know, the the whole like hunger games divergence like school of YA fantasy and yeah and I really really wanted to do that um and so I started like trying I think like in high school and college I like started and abandoned like three or four different like ideas for like a, a YA fantasy or like sci-fi fantasy series but I just like I think it's really important as a writer to know your strengths and know your weaknesses. And for me, I am not a good fantasy world builder and it was really hard for me. And I was like, the only things that I'm good at and that I enjoy doing in all of these projects I've tried to write were the relationships in them. And I would still be thinking about like these characters and I would want to finish the story because I cared so much about that relationship that I had come up with in the story. And I was like, well, you know, I do read romance and that that is a genre. Um, so what if I could try just writing contemporary romance? Um, and so like, I was like working a day job. I had, um, I was working in like, like the local media, um, just kind of like small local, um, like freelance stuff. And I was like, you know, I feel like if I really try, I could maybe write a book. Um, and I think I could write a contemporary romance. And so it was basically just like my passion project for like a couple years was Red, White, and Royal Blue, my first book. Um, and I made some friends on, you know, there's a lot of like online communities for like aspiring writers, um, you know, like on like, Twitter and Instagram and where I guess TikTok now. Um, and so I'd made some friends who were helping me figure out like, how do I query? How do I find an agent and all of that? And I found my agent and from there, it all kind of like moved really fast. Like it was all of a sudden I was talking to editors and then I was talking about, you know, okay, let's get this ready uh, to go to found manuscripts and all of the stuff. I mean, it, it just all really, really um, was very surreal um, because I had always wanted to write, but it was not, I think on some level, I never really believed that it would happen, you know? Um, so. That was pretty, that was, that was kind of the story. I mean, my, my career origin stories before, um, before books are really not that, and it's not that exciting. Cause I was, I was just doing like freelance and like local journalism work. Um, just trying to anything I could do to write and make money I was doing. Um, yeah. um and then, and then I managed to sell a book. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's amazing. That's the dream, right? Yeah. And it was a huge hit. So, I mean, I'm sure that's especially awesome. 
Sorry, there's Thank someone you. running down the hall. There's a little kid outside, I think. It's okay, it's okay. But yeah, that's amazing. You mentioned you've always been a big romance reader and you love writing romance. Do you have any tropes mm-hmm. that you especially like to read or write? And are they the same, yeah. the ones you like to read versus write? Mm. Yeah, there are definitely some some that I like to read, but um, enjoy reading more than writing. Um, I love I love a good fake dating. Um, but I feel like it has to be done really well. Like you really need to like establish both characters really well and to build that tension. Cause otherwise it's like, just kiss, like just kiss for real. I don't understand why you can't just kiss for real. Um, I love, I obviously I love an enemies or a rivals to lovers dynamic reading and writing it. Um, but uh, that I think is obvious. I don't think anybody would be surprised to hear that for me. Um, I love, um, I love a marriage of convenience situation or like, um, like a, oh, don't fall in love with your, or like arranged husband situation, like very, uh, very historical, um, type of thing. I love, um, I love a widow who's like getting her groove back, uh, which is another thing I really, in, that comes up in historicals a lot that I enjoy. Um, so yeah, I feel like those are some of my greatest hits. I, um, and of course I love like, a, um, I love anything that involves like a, a cat and mouse thing where it's like, oh, like, like, uh, very killing Eve, you know, like, oh, yeah. she's, she's a, a sexy criminal and he's like, got to figure out, he's like the PI who's got to figure out what she's up to. And like, I don't know. I love that. I <laughs> so. love killing Eve. It's one of my absolute favorite shows. I'm obsessed with it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I can't wait till the whole new season is on Hulu. I'm really excited. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You probably can't say, but do you think I Kiss Share a Whaler will ever be a movie or like a show? Because I could totally see it as one after like growing up watching shows, like you mentioned, like Pretty Little Liars and stuff that are similar in some ways. Yeah, I, I mean, you're right. I can't really say, but I will say I would, I think I would love to see it as a series. Um I think it like there's so many there's such a big cast and I feel like especially like Smith and Roy's characters can really be built out even more when like it's not just from Chloe's point of view um and I think like there's so much there like it would be such a fun tv show and I I really missed like I don't feel like we have like tv for teens the way that we did when I was like in high school yeah, well, I actually really loved each of the characters in this book. So Smith, Rory, and Chloe were all such, like, great characters. And even though they kind of, at least Rory and Smith, fell into, like, a classic high school bucket, they were, you know, so fun and so fun to read about. How did you decide, like, what they would be, who they would be, these other people that share a kiss? Um, You know, I kind of, I love playing with, like, arch, like, like archetypes of different um, characters or like when you look at a high school structure and you imagine like, you know, sort of the breakfast club, like what are the like five major types of person you'll see. And I think that's something a lot of YA authors like really enjoy playing with. Um, And for me, I was like, well, Shara is the prom queen. And I really want these, these like four, these three characters to feel like they come from completely different parts of the ecosystem that she's in. And I also want them to kind of represent like these three different huge facets of her narrative. Cause like Smith is like the perfect boyfriend. She's the one like, that's like the perfect couple side of her where she's like royalty at this high school and her image is exactly what she wants it to be. And then Smith kind of, so that was Smith, that was Smith. And then Rory represents, um, I feel like the, the part of the student body who really doesn't know her at all, but still sees her as this dream girl and puts her on this pedestal and imagines, you know, that one day she could fall in love with them if they were like special enough or in the right place. And so I feel like Rory is really like kind of the audience that Shara, like Smith is part of the performance and Rory is the audience. And then Chloe represents kind of like the person, like the, the very, very tiny pretty much only Chloe portion of the student body who like does not buy what she's selling you know um so I thought it would be the best way to kind of explore the different sides of her the whole Shara mythos or whatever by having these three people who who 
are like probably like the three most important people in her life in terms of like like the like how they hold up her narrative you know um and so if she's going to be spending this book deconstructing her own narrative and they are the ones who are going to need to do that work for her um like they're kind of like the key pieces in the puzzle for her and so that kind of informed what the characters were going to be like because I knew that you know if she's going to have this perfect boyfriend he's got to be the quarterback but then like okay how do I subvert these classic tropes of a quarterback you know a lot of it was just like figuring out tropes and then being like how can I flip this on its head you know um so that was really fun and that kind of just informed what the characters are going to be like and then obviously also they were very much inspired by I keep bringing up like these early 2000s um tv shows but they were so great and inspired so much of what I wanted to do in the book because I really wanted to capture like the high that I felt when I was watching those things and so I think that Rory has like big like Jess Mariano Gilmore Girls vibes I feel like uh, or like he's kind of almost like a combo of Seth Cohen and Ryan Atwood on the OC like kind of both of them mer like like <laughs> in one body and then Smith I mean like I think every teen show of all time has like the popular job. Yeah, you need to have the popular job. Um, and I was like, how can I subvert that in a way I haven't seen before? And for him, I don't want to like spoil a lot of his character arc, but I did. I do think I came up with a way to subvert and explore that kind of type uh, that I haven't personally seen before. So that was fun. Um, so yeah, so, and then Chloe, obviously, I mean, I think Chloe just, to me, Chloe is so inspired by so many of my readers and so many of like my target demographic um, of just like really smart, intense, um, like queer kids who maybe struggle to fit in or, um, you know, have like really strong ideas about what they believe in. Um, and I really wanted them to be able to see themselves in this book. And so I feel like I wrote Chloe um specifically to be relatable to the type of like teen reader that I knew I was probably going to pick up the book yeah Chloe so felt that. modern to me she felt like more modern than the characters that I watched and chose growing up you know like very mm -hmm. in the now whereas Smith is yeah. more like you definitely well no spoilers yes. but he felt a little <laughs> more classic especially initially well yeah and I think that's like kind of very something I did deliberately because Chloe is supposed to feel like a bit of an outsider and she's coming from LA into this you know small town in Alabama and so and like I mean it's sort of the thing of like when you live in a small town like you don't get like all the cool stuff until like five years after people in the city get it I think for it's kind of the same thing of like I wanted Chloe to feel like this fish out of water and like somebody who you know is coming into this environment from a totally different background and and kind of almost a different experience um and so yeah i i think i i thank you for that because that makes me feel like i accomplished that yeah she was definitely great i love that she had two moms too i have two moms and that's something you almost never oh, read cool. honestly so that was just yeah. like fun to see casually dropped in you know not as like the whole book yeah. i love that yeah 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 i love chloe's moms they were so fun to write Mm -hmm. yeah they seemed fun it's yeah yeah I love them and how they were like embracing being there too in a way that she wasn't necessarily yeah. it was really sweet yeah yeah well what do you hope that readers like take away from this book like you said that Chloe was really written as someone who your demographic would relate to what's the like mm -hmm. number one thing you hope that readers walk away with I mean, it's, I think that it depends on what the reader is, because there are, I imagine like a lot of readers coming to this book from a similar background as, you know, where it's set. Um, and for those, those readers, especially the teen readers, I want them to feel like they're not alone. And like, you know, there are, this story is like, there are stories like this out there for you and that you can be a part of, you know, uh, big shiny rom-com happy ending um and that there are like adults who come out the other side of it and who are now you know waiting for you on the other side um 
but then there's also like I feel like there are people like Chloe who you know Chloe kind of also represents the point of view that most people will be coming into the book with which is really not being familiar with this type of pepper sorry really not being familiar with this type of environment and also um kind of maybe having a lot of preconceived notions about the type of people who are in it and maybe coming in with a little bit of um you know negative ideas of you know kind of sweeping negative general ideas of of this type of environment and the people in it um and so i for that type of reader i really hope that they can take away this idea that um that there are people that you can relate to in a lot of different places in the world and we can't just leave them behind and that we can't just write them off um once again my like chip on my shoulder about blue texas is like coming into play um so yeah i think those are my big takeaways um and i really just want people to have a good time too i think it's a fun book and i want people to have fun i think we really desperately need some fun um right now in this world and so i hope people take away um a feeling of having had a good time i am 100 percent sure they will take that away is there anything else that you want to tell people any upcoming projects where to find you where to hear more about your work yeah i mean yeah so um i guess shower wheeler is currently available for pre-order um pretty much any major retailer um or if you want to go to bit.ly slash I kiss Char Wheeler. You can find like all of the links in one place. Um, or you can just go to my website, caseymcquiston.com. Um, and then if you would like to follow me on Twitter, it's at case, it's at Casey underscore McQuiston. And then Instagram is Casey.mcquiston. I always mix those two up. Um, and yeah, upcoming stuff. Um, I have a hardcover special collector's edition of red white and royal blue coming out in october um and that is something we are super excited about we've been doing a lot of work behind the scenes um to i mean it's like going to be such a cool package it's going to have illustrated end papers um i wrote like an eight thousand word bonus chapter that's all from henry's point of view yeah and that's going to be at the end of the book um and it's like a whole bunch of new stuff um I'm really, really excited for people to, to, to get it. I think it's going to be such a cool thing for fans of the book. Um, and even if like new readers too, I think it's going to be great. Um, and then beyond that, um, I really can't spoil too much yet, but I can say that I am going to be starting on my fourth book soon and it's another queer rom-com. So that's the, uh, that's the headlines right now. I'm so excited. I can't wait for that special edition and for your new work when it eventually comes out. But thank you, Casey, so much for coming on. It's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. Thank you so much. Take care. Thank you all for watching. You can listen to this episode in podcast form on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. Subscribe for more bookish content.